Over the years, I have taught thousands of people how to start and maintain a thriving organic vegetable garden. But you know, it doesn't matter how long you've been gardening, the steps to success are still the same. So in this video, I'm going to show you my top 10 tips to start and maintain a thriving organic vegetable garden, especially if you're a beginner. First, find a sunny spot. Now you could do everything else right, but if you don't set your plants up for success, they won't thrive. Now with vegetable plants, that means full sun. And what is full sun? At least eight hours a day. And I realize we don't all have a spot where we get that much sun, but the closer that you can get to that, the healthier your plants will be. Next, focus on building healthy soil. Just as full sun is so important for plants above ground, creating healthy soil is the best thing that you can do for your plants below ground. So what is healthy soil? Well, when you look at it, it looks rich and dark and earthy like this. But there's also something that you can do that's a good indication that you've got good soil, and I call it the squeeze test. So if you get a handful of soil like this and you squeeze it together, it should bind like that but when you run your fingers through it, it should easily break apart. Now that's a good indication that there's enough moisture in the soil to hold it together so the plant roots have access to that water when they need it, but it's also gonna prevent your plants from drowning by just holding too much water. This is the perfect combination. So how do you make this happen? How do you get to perfect soil from ordinary garden soil? Well, you add lots of organic matter to that. One of the things that you can do is either make compost or you can buy it, but compost is a great amendment into your soil to make it better. But there are other things that you can do. I love to use shredded leaves. I work them into the soil and I use them as mulch, but there are lots of options. You could use aged manure, ground up pine bark mulch, old grass clippings. You've got lots of options, but the more organic matter that you can add to your soil Soil, the better your soil is going to be and the healthier your plants will be too. Start with healthy seedlings. Now while it is super fun to start plants from seed, when you're creating a vegetable garden, especially when you're new, there's a lot to do and plenty to learn. So leave the seed starting to the experts, go to an independent garden center, look for those healthy seedlings and get them in the ground. But how do you know if they're healthy? Well first of all, just generally they should look healthy overall, good coloration, good and compact, no discoloration in the foliage and certainly free of pests and diseases. And if you really want to check the plant out, you can take it out of the container and look at those roots. But this is a great looking seedling. This is spinach. And I'll just pop these into the ground to supplement the ones that are already here that I did start from seed, water them in, and they will take off. So find the healthy seedlings that you can, get them put into the ground, watered in, and they will take off and be super healthy. Next, be sure to space your plants properly. So after you get your seedlings and you're putting them in the ground, pay attention to the information that's on that tiny little plant tag. It's gonna tell you how far apart to space your plants and how much room between the rows you need for the plants to be as productive as possible. Now keep in mind, when you're getting those little guys in the ground, they're little and they're gonna get really big and you have to trust that. This is broccoli and it gets very large and I've spaced this 20 inches apart. And you need that spacing for two main reasons. First of all, as you already know, vegetable plants need as much sun as possible. So by providing that appropriate space, these plants aren't gonna shade out each other. And that's the first thing. The second is good air circulation. The more air circulation you have moving around the plants is gonna help you cut down on any disease and pest issues. So that's super important. Now, it's counterproductive when you try to pack everything in because you're going to deny the plants the light and the air circulation that they need. So trust the information that's on the tag, space them appropriately, and your plants will be a lot healthier. Now, once you get those seedlings in the ground, it's really important to add about a two inch layer of natural mulch. Now, all the things I talked about for improving your soil, you can use as mulch too. For example, I'm using shredded leaves. It's my favorite mulch and it's free. And so I'm applying about a two inch layer between all of my plants. Now mulch does so many things to keep your plants healthy and improve your soil. Namely, it's going to keep moisture in the soil so your plants are gonna have access to water longer. It's gonna keep weeds down because it's gonna block the ability for light to get to those seeds that cause weeds. They're not gonna germinate so you have less weeds. It's gonna keep your soil 
cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter time. That's a good thing. And then it's going to prevent a lot of diseases that live in your soil from splashing up onto your plants when it rains. And then again, as it breaks down, it's improving your soil. So mulch is a very important thing to do in your gardening progress. Okay, a fresh new layer of mulch is down. I love mulch also because it just looks so good around your plants. But now let's talk about watering. Definitely one of the top 10 tips is how to do it properly. It's not the leaves that need the water, it's the roots that need the water. So when you're watering, why not make the most of your time and this resource and just keep it right at the ground level. A good way to do that is with a watering wand like this. So it's just a long wand with a water breaker. You can get these in different sizes. I like this small, narrow one. But it's like a little bit of rain right at the base of the plant. And that's going to deliver it slowly enough so the roots have a chance to take it up and send it into the leaves. The reason why you don't want to get those leaves wet, that can actually promote plant disease. The longer those leaves stay wet, the greater the chance of disease promotion. So avoid that at all costs. I know you can't do it when it's raining, but you can also avoid it otherwise. So just water the base nice and slow. What you need to do is about an inch of water each week. Now you can break that up into two or three applications, but that's about it. In the absence of rain, by the way, so if you get the rain, you don't even need to come back here and water. In fact, more plants die from overwatering than underwatering. So the key is just to make sure that you apply the right amount. And if you want to know a good, easy way to do that, it's called the finger test. So what you do, just stick your finger into the soil. And if it comes back up with dirt kind of stuck to your finger, that's an indication that there is enough moisture in the soil that you don't need to add supplemental water. But if you were to put your finger into that soil and it comes up relatively clean, that means your soil is dry and it needs water. So that's a good rule of thumb and it's called the finger test. You can also use soaker hoses and drip irrigation. Soaker hoses are basically porous tubing. It leaks out water, which is nice, nice and slow. Then there's drip irrigation, which is what I typically use around all of my beds. That's more precise watering where you have a supply line running down the garden bed and then you have spaghetti tubing out to your plants with emitter tips on the end that deliver a measured amount of water over a period of time. So if you really want to dial in your watering, drip irrigation is a great way to go. A critical step in maintaining a thriving, healthy garden is proactive disease management. Try as you might, no matter what, diseases will eventually find their way into your garden. So it's up to you to stay on top of it. And the first thing that you can do when you're buying those new seedlings is to look them over carefully like we talked about. And if you see any signs or suspect disease, leave those plants behind. Don't introduce the possibility of those coming into your garden and spreading diseases to the rest of your plants. But once you have your plants in the ground, come out as often as you can to inspect them. That's the proactive part. Look your plants over and try to see if you notice any changes from day to day. And in this case, I have my pepper plants that I put in about six months ago. And overall, they've been completely disease free and very few pests, super healthy as you can see, but I still see some signs of recent change. So this may be a sign of disease. Now I happen to know from experience it's actually pest damage, little tiny spider mites that you can barely see with your naked eye, but that causes the damage that you see on top. But this also resembles some type of disease damage. Other things that you may notice would be just a change in foliage color where you have these yellow spots or you could have brown spots or what looks like targets or the spots start to merge together or the edges start to burn up. That could all be signs of various diseases. So that will just take time for you to learn what those are. But in the meantime, if you suspect that it might be a disease, then go ahead and remove that foliage, cut it out, but also minimize the contact that you make with those plants, either with your tools or your hands, because that can be a spreader to the other plants. So take them out and throw them away. Don't put them in the compost pile or just use them as mulch. Get them off your property so they don't have a chance of coming back next season. Now you could also use a fungicide, but that even with organics is a chemical that I try to minimize any use of. And I think the best approach is to stay proactive. And something else that you can do is look for disease resistant plants. There are letters on the plant tags that indicate what they're resistant to. And there's a lot of them, so you'll need to do your homework. But figure out what it is that you want to grow and then go online or do your research and see if there are varieties that are resistant to certain diseases and then seek those out either at the garden center or maybe you can order them online. But there are several ways to stay ahead of your disease problems. One of the top 10 tips for having a healthy garden is staying ahead of your pest problem. 
no matter how good of a gardener you are, pests will find their way into your garden. So there are several things that you can do to minimize that problem. And one is to stay ahead of it. And the best way to do that is with physical barriers. Now, what's a physical barrier? Well, typically, it's lightweight row cover. This is just polyester fabric. It's very thin, so light and air and water can pass through, but it blocks or prevents egg-laying pests from landing on the foliage and then laying eggs that turn into caterpillars in this case. And so this is called Reme commonly. Another option for this that's also a lightweight barrier is really what is wedding veil, tool as it's called. And you can buy this by the roll. It's not as sturdy, but it's definitely effective at preventing some of those pests. Now, I haven't been out in my garden every day as I should have, but that's okay. I'm kind of glad that I see this problem. And I've noticed that I've got a little bit of a pest problem here, and I wanted to show you that. And this is because I didn't have that lightweight row cover over these plants. This is Brussels sprouts to block the cabbage butterfly from landing on this foliage and laying eggs that become what you see right now, these little caterpillars. So the next thing that you can do once you have your pests on your plants, physical removal literally taking them off if you're not squeamish or if you want to wear gloves and just getting rid of them. It's 100% effective every time, but you just have to look around and find them on your plants and especially under the leaves. That's where you usually find them, but you'll see the damage. So just jump on top of it as fast as possible. Now, if hand removal isn't your thing or there are just too many of them and it is a caterpillar, a really nice biological organic control is BT. It often is called dipel dust, but it is just a dust that you sprinkle over the tops of the plants and it affects the digestive system of caterpillars and they die within a few days. And that's the end of it, but it's safe for everything but caterpillars, so it's a great choice and about the only thing I use that's not hand removal or physical barrier. But the bottom line is the more that you can do on the front end and physical barriers are really the best thing or hand removal, or if you have to resort to a biological or organic control, do it early and you won't have to do it as often. Staying on top of weeds is always on my top 10 list for healthy garden. And weeds are just a fact of life and it doesn't matter how good of a gardener you are, weeds will find their way in. Now besides the fact that they're just unsightly, they're also a big competitor for the resources that your plants need, namely water and nutrients. So if for no other reason, get them out for that. But there's another important reason you want those weeds gone. They are a vector for plant diseases because a lot of the diseases that are in weeds are fed on by insects that then come over to your desired plants and then spread the disease that way. And it's a very common way that diseases make their rounds in your garden. So get those weeds out. The sooner that you can get on top of the weed problem, the easier it is to stay ahead of it. And the sooner you do it, the better off you'll be.